Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 267 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron, and I'm really pleased that you're here today for so many reasons. Oh my God, so many reasons. The first is Tiffany Yates Martin. We had a chat. She's the coolest. She is my friend now because we claimed each other as friends. And you know those moments when you find another friend and you claim them. Um, we're besties, even though we live very far apart now, farther apart than ever. Uh, but she's amazing. And I love her approach to revision. I have for a while now. And we really had a fantastic chat. So that's coming up. Uh, what's going on around here? Well, if you're watching on YouTube, I'm in my new room in my house, where I live, in Wellington. There's really not much to see. So if you're just listening on the podcast, you're not missing anything. There's just a blank wall behind me and a, um, a painting of a fern behind me because this is where I have set up my microphone. My microphone is set up again. And y'all, let me just tell you about the house. It is everything we dreamed about and more. It is incredible incredible. The view from the windows is of the Wellington Harbor. Google Wellington Harbor, if you haven't seen those, or go to my, better yet, go to my Instagram, uh, instagram.com slash Rachel Heron, and look at some of the views out the windows. From the kitchen dining room, harbor. From Lala's office, harbor. From living room, harbor. From my office, it looks out into the little garden that is full of flowers. It is spring here, and these flowers have just been growing on their own, um, just from the rains that have come. I went out earlier today, and I picked flowers, and I came back with an armful. That will also be on Instagram. I will post that, um, including lilacs. And my room right now, my office, smells like lilacs, and it is heaven, heaven. We're up 48 steps on the side of a hill. Um, we changed everything around in the house, which was really, really fun. I mentioned that we are renting, but we bought all the stuff that Cassidy, hello, Cassidy, if you're listening, thank you, that Cassidy and Sam uh, left behind because they moved to the States. So we bought everything and then we moved everything around. I was going to have the smaller, darker room for my office um, and Lala was going to have this room here with a view onto the garden. And then we realized the smaller, darker room would hold a bed. Small, dark rooms are great for sleeping in. So we both have these stunning, big rooms with perfect views because I love a garden view. Honestly, if I had the harbor view, I would just be staring at boats all day and uh, not get anything done. And I have a bed in my office, which I didn't think I would like. Um, it's the spare bed and I love it. I put every pillow in the house and there were a lot of pillows. Thank you, Cassidy, um, on the bed. And it is now this big couch and I do my morning pages on it in the morning. Um, I set up a monitor, which I've never had a monitor like this, that kind of faces at the foot of the bed. And I am currently doing romance author mastermind, which is a big conference and it goes all weekend. And so I'm just turning it on down there and cozying up in the pillows and taking notes on my iPad at this conference. And this house just feels wonderful. It feels like home. It feels like home. We just got back from walking downtown to the Daiso. It took about 45 minutes to walk there. We took the bus home after we stopped at New World and got some groceries for dinner. And I have salmon cooking right now. And my timer is going to go off in just a couple of minutes so that we can eat dinner. Because we left the house on foot. We went shopping. And we came back on the bus. I can't even tell you. For so long, I have lived in a place. I loved Oakland with all my heart. I will always love Oakland. I'm an Oakland girl. But where we lived for the last 17 years, and for me the last 19 years, we couldn't walk anywhere. There was nowhere to walk. Even the liquor store had closed. Um, and just walking with the dogs was really too dangerous in most of the parts because a lot of blocks had off-leash dogs. And it was just a hairy situation. There was nowhere to walk. So we would always drive about 20 minutes to go anywhere, to the grocery store, to walk the dogs. Um, here you can't drive 20 minutes. If you drive 20 minutes, you're out of town. Driving downtown takes five minutes. It's a big, tiny city. 
a big city and it's so tiny and wonderful and I am just in love. I am in love. I unpacked my suitcase yesterday. I unpacked both my suitcases yesterday because I hadn't done it yet. We've been here for a couple of days, but we've been just like organizing things. So everything I own is in the closet over there. It's amazing. And un- uh, not unfortunately, but at some point, um, our boxes that we shipped over on the pallets on the ship will arrive. They're somewhere in Wellington. I don't want them. I don't want them. I have everything I need. I have all the clothes I need. I have, we have all the cooking things we need. How did we, why did we send these boxes over? I know most of mine are filled with books and journals and stuff like that, and I'll find storage for them. But right now I love looking at my bookcase and it's got like nine books because I bought them here and I haven't read them yet. Oh, I'm just enjoying this feeling and really dreading all the boxes and we will hire somebody to bring them up those 48 steps. We have no furniture. I have one cedar chest um, that my mom gave me, Uh, but otherwise we have no furniture, just small boxes, but I'm not bringing them up. Oh no, it was, it was a chore just getting our big ass suitcases up those 48 steps. It's heaven. I know it's real life too. We're going to live here and have a real life and have troubles and heartaches and difficulties and irritations and all of those things. But right now I'm not feeling any of it. I'm just giddy. I am giddy at being home for the first time in almost six months and able to relax for the first time since February when we started doing all this. And it is now November and it just feels really, really freaking good. So um, now we get to I just get to shunt you into this interview that I had with Tiffany while I was locked down in Russell up in the Northland of New Zealand. Um, So in that, in that beach house that I was in and it's a wonderful talk. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, We'll talk writing next week. You're writing, right? If you're not writing, get a little writing done. Um, And I've been writing, I've been getting stuff done. It's very strange. Uh, And now I'll get more done because I have an office anyway. I'm going to quit waxing Rhapsodic and let you listen to this interview with Tiffany. Enjoy, my friends. Well, I could not be more pleased today to welcome to the show Tiffany Yates Martin. Tiffany, hello. Hello, Rachel Heron. I'm so pleased to be here with you. Uh, We have been trying to get this particular interview done for a while, and I am a fangirl of Tiffany, and I want to tell you why, so let me give you a little bit of her bio first. Uh, Tiffany Yates Martin has spent nearly 30 years as an editor in the publishing industry, working with major publishers and New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today bestselling and award-winning authors, as well as indie and newer writers, and she is the founder of Fox Print Editorial and the author of the bestseller, which is a book I love, Intuitive Editing, a Creative and practical guide to revising your writing. She's led workshops and seminars for conferences and writers groups across the country and is a frequent contributor to writer sites and publications. Under the name Phoebe Fox, she's the author of six novels, including the upcoming The Way We Weren't from Penguin Berkeley. Wait, Berkeley is Penguin, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Got that right. And uh, so I looked at the cover of that, that comes out in November, depending on when this goes out, it might already be out. Um, Congratulations on that. It's a gorgeous cover and it looks like an amazing premise. Of, Thank you. I love that. Co- it's probably my favorite cover of any of my books. Incredible. Except intuitive editing. <laughs> <laughs> intuitive editing has a wonderful, wonderful cover. And to be honest, like let's back up to how we know each other. I know you because I love revision. Like that is my jam. Um, we both agree, you know, s- puke out that first draft and then make it something good. And, but I spent so, I spent so many years looking for help with revision, looking for somebody that I could throw to students, um, somebody who kind of echoed a lot of my own sentiments about revision. And then I found intuitive editing. Can you tell us a little bit about that book and how it came to be? How, how do you come to revision? Yeah, this is like one of the reasons I really vibe with you is because <laughs> everything you talk about on your show is so much what, what you just said is everything yeah. I wrote the book for, because there's so much out there about how to write yeah. and so little out there about how to revise and how Almost to edit your own nothing. work. Every, yeah. probably every year or two, I go through Amazon and I, I see what else has like been released and there's nothing that has ever been released. Yeah. That is like your book. There's just, nothing. and it is the bulk of what yep. writing is. Yep. I mean, I've been doing this for almost 30 years and I over and over and over, I see how much books find their feet and take shape and deepen and develop. And the vision that the author has for their book actually comes to life 
during yes. the process of what, what are usually three passes I do with publishers and um, often yeah. with authors. Ooh, I mean, it's a yeah. lot of revision. It's the bulk yeah. of the work. But nobody How? talks about it. And so then authors finish their first draft or early drafts and they think, oh, why do I suck as a writer? Why can't I do what my favorite authors do? It's because you haven't revised the living daylights out of it. And it is something that you need to learn. It's a series. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a bucket. Of, it's a, I can't even think of the word for it. A, um, what do you put your tools, a toolbox, a toolbox where you put your tools <laughs> of tools. This is where my brain is today that we can learn and then use over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Um, but you have to learn about it. So I'll take us back to when you first started, when did you learn about editing? Oh, um, well, I started editing, like I said, about 30 years ago, I was an actor. I mentioned that to you a second ago, and I was living in New York and like every other actor, I was waiting tables and didn't want to do that forever. So I had been an English major. And one day in the New York times, I see an article that says, or is like a little classified ad. And it says, get paid for reading books. Send us $25. <laughs> we'll sell, we'll sell, we'll tell you how. And I'm thinking, uh-huh, sure. Like, I'm sure this is a scam. I and love I that so you- poor. Oh my God. I love that. This is how you came to revision was from that. Little Isn't this weird? <laughs> I, yeah. In the New York times, this is how analog it was back then. So I, so I sent them my $25, which was a fortune to me at the time. And sure enough, this thing was full of really good information about how to find out how to become a copy editor or proofreader. And I hadn't done it before, but I thought, well, I'm an English major. This is what I'm good at. So I followed all the instructions and I sent away for the tests and you start working for one publisher and it's a really, you know, this, it's a very small business yeah. world. And so, you know, one tells two friends and they tell yeah. two friends. And so before I knew it, I was working for most of the big six and a whole bunch of smaller presses. And I did that for about 15 years. And then maybe a dozen years ago, I thought I would like to move into developmental editing because after all this time, you know, this was back in the day, kids before the internet, right. when I'm actually working on the copy edited the hard copy. or the edited galleys, right? Yeah. Or yeah, the hard copy of the original manuscript plus the galleys when I'm proofreading. And I'm seeing all the things that have been done to this story from the very beginning. So it was the best training ground I could ever have asked yeah. for. Yeah. So I started, I wanted to do it, but I had no track record. And one of the authors I had copy edited for happened to live here in Austin and I'd gotten to know her. And she said she was struggling with something. And I said, um, I'll developmental edit that for you for free if you trust me. And she said, yes. And she was super pleased with our work and told a bunch of friends. And again, it just snowballed. So I haven't copy edited in gosh, at least 10 years. And hopefully you've let go of those skills. Like God, no, God. Uh, no, you they're can still there. You can't let go. <laughs> but I love them, so it doesn't <laughs> bother me. How is the what is the difference that you feel? Because um, I have done developmental editing and I love doing it, and I'm not an expert at it, but I'm I'm okay at it. Um, but it's so easy to developmentally edit somebody else mm. when you're at the 30,000 yeah, foot level, looking story. down mm -hmm. at their story. How, how do you handle that feeling inside yourself when you are writing your own books <laughs> or, or perhaps you're going to tell me that your editors come back to you and say, okay, Tiffany, it's perfect. Do a little, we're going to put it right oh, into no, copy no, editing. No. Does that happen? <laughs> I don't think anybody can see their own work objectively. I don't think, I don't think really hard. You have, how to have does someone it feel to though? The mirror up. That was probably the hardest skill I had to learn as yeah. a writer, especially because I identify more as an uh, editor than an author. Yeah. I mean, that's my soul. So yeah. every time I sat down to write, especially once I began editing, um, it was really hard to get out of editor brain, but yeah. honestly, that's kind of what a writer has to do too. I think one of the reasons we get stuck in our uh, drafting process is we're too busy trying to edit it. We're too busy judging it. We're too busy being our own critic and you have to put all that aside. And as you said, puke it up onto the page and not worry. No one's ever going to see it. Who cares what it looks like? You will fix it in post as we used to say when I was an actor. So it's easy to say that we have to do that. Um, but you know, we, we, we talk about this a lot on the show that, you know, the theory of the gap that we are incredible mm -hmm. readers and we have great taste and a first draft is such crap that it is so difficult to look at. And it's so different. It's so difficult to silence that editor's brain. Even if one has never been an editor, the editor's head is still screaming <laughs> at you. This sucks. This That's sucks. true. So how, do you have any tips for on the ground? I know we're actually leaving editing, going into first drafting here, but do you have tips on how to silence that editor? Oh, yes. <laughs> that Please was lay like, some seriously, that was such a skill for me to learn. It used to be my biggest challenge. I yeah, me too. have a mantra. Ooh, <laughs> I have a couple. Yay. 
but my big one is permission to suck. Yeah. And before I begin writing, I, I sort of say it like a mission statement <laughs> right before I start, you have permission to suck. No one's ever going to see it. You can do whatever you want to with it. Also, I have this sitting on a post-it note right by my computer that I just discovered like maybe a year ago. Um, Michael J. Fox was writing a memoir and his brother-in-law is Michael Pollan, the food writer. You and he that? said the best ad- Isn't that crazy? <laughs> Famous Michael. Tracy Pollan. Yeah, oh, of yeah. course. Of course. So yeah. he said the uh, best advice that Michael Pollan gave him when he was writing was velocity and the truth. And I love that. Oh. It's just speed through it and say what's real, oh, which is, that, which that actually kind of connects me to what gives me that ability to shut the editor up when I'm writing, which is to stop concentrating on what I, especially as an editor, what I want it to look like, how I want it to come across, how I'm judging it. And instead just think about why did I want to write this? What is it I want to mm. say? What happens next? And just live in the process of it, not worrying about the product of it. I, we're not, I don't even know if we're going to touch the questions that we, I normally ask that I sent you, that, <laughs> that you know, um, because I'm just so, so curious. I have a million questions to ask from everything that you've just said. Um, so when you are, what, what percentage planner pantser are you? <laughs> um, I generally, if I'm writing fiction, I generally yeah. start with like, um, the characters start to, you probably do this too. It's all noodling around in my head before I ever start to try to write for a long time. Like it incubates for sometimes years before I even start to write it. And it's nothing I'm doing consciously. It's just, it's like forming back there. So when I finally sit down to write, I generally know who the players are and why I want to write it, which basically for me has to do with some journey I want to send them on emotionally because I I write women's fiction. Mm -hmm. And I generally know where they're going to end up and where they're starting from. And that's about it. I might know a couple of things that are going to happen, but if I know it's no fun for me, I don't want to write it anymore. You just had Lisa Scottolini on God. I love that interview. interview. I wrote her a fan letter today, Rachel, for that interview, because it was so good. And the two of you just saying everything that I believe about writing and editing and all this wonderful wisdom, like shield your own candle, loved it. Oh, all. that was so good. Yeah. yeah. But both of you were talking about the fact that um, I have no idea what I was just saying. Um, oh, pl- not the crap. You don't know where you're going. Right, right, right. You were both saying that, or she said particularly that that's the fun of it for her. She doesn't want to know where it's going because if she does, she doesn't want to write it. And that's kind of how I feel. I'm telling myself yeah. the story as much as anything else. And then with my nonfiction writing, like intuitive editing or articles for like Writer's Digest or Jane Friedman or wherever, um, that's the velocity and the truth one comes in handy there. Because sometimes I worry about, am I saying this just right? Is it going to be clear? Um, You know, does it sound good because I'm supposed to be the expert? And then I just go, shut up. What is it that you are trying to convey? And why does this matter to you? And just say that thing. And then you can go back and fix it. The reason I love the fact that you call it a mantra and that it is a mantra to you, the permission to suck is that I think we don't talk often enough about how frequently we have to remind ourselves Mm. that we must have this permission to suck. Like, I think there are some writers and I'm one of them who think, well, I'm going to give myself permission to suck at this book. Great. I did it once I checked it off the list and I'm going to sit down the next (laughs) day and I've already forgotten. I can forget half hour to half hour and go back into that really tight place where there's no velocity. There's no truth. There's just me trying to sound good. Even though I don't even know what I'm talking about. I don't know what the book is about yet. Um, I'm writing. And we're such critics of ourselves. I would never critique any other writer the way I critique myself for a first draft. I'm writing actually the, the course that I teach 90 days to done. I've decided to do the book. So I'm writing that book right now. And it's the worst because I keep trying to sound good. And I, and every day <laughs> I have to remind myself and the velocity and truth is really going to stick with me to just write fast, write crappy and write what I know, write what yeah. I know to be true. And then I'll make it sound good later. But even yeah. in something like, like that, in simple think, nonfiction, I have to remember that. It's true because you're probably like me and, you know, obviously you want to sound like, you know, what you're talking yeah. about and you care about the words like all authors, but you also, I think are like me because I just from listening to your podcast, you're very good extemporaneously yeah. when you're really just talking about that thing and it's all coming to you. And that's what I think we can lose as a fiction writer, yes. nonfiction, whatever that sense, you know, when you're walking your dog or taking a shower and these brilliant things are going through your head and then you sit down and you're like, 
trying to make it as perfect as you can and you lose all of that beautiful, messy spontaneity that brings the story to life. That is one thing that I do every once in a while when I remember it, when I'm on the walk and I'm having the breakthrough, I will start recording that. I don't necessarily mm. record what I'm going to write. Um, I've, I've done dictation and I don't love it personally, but I'll send myself in the cloud that messy, like 73 paragraph thing that I just <laughs> verbalized while I was walking. Me and too. in there, there's two or three. Oh, that's the idea I wanted to bring. That's yeah. the feeling that I wanted to bring. Yeah. It's almost like brainstorming with yourself. Yeah, ex exactly. And I don't want to do it really with anybody else most of the time. No, my my I don't wife, want anyone knowing what's happening in there. It's messy. <laughs> <laughs> so I okay. think it just pops out like, <laughs> like gorgeous, gorgeous, extemporaneously and perfect the first <laughs> time. So, um, tell us now, like how, what is your, I'm really curious as to what your process is like right now that you do both nonfiction and fiction. Are you ever working on two projects at the same time or do you focus on one? No, it's worked out weirdly. So I, I had a book come out, uh, last year and I have another one coming out in November and I'm getting all these emails from people because intuitive editing also came out last year. <laughs> <laughs> and was it uh, last everybody's year? I swear it was like 20 two years. Yeah, May oh my god. Okay. Yeah. So uh plus I do a lot of, you know, I probably write 60 articles or more a year. And you know what I mean? Like I do yeah. a lot of this stuff. Everyone's super impressed with me, but I'm <laughs> I'm sort of cheating because when I signed the penguin contract, both these books happen to be written. <laughs> So I look really fabulous. Cool. Yeah. Oh, so that's I don't, so cool. it's hard. It would be hard for me to work on both at the same time. I think like right now I'm working on a follow-up to intuitive where I just, uh, one by one with each of the topics in there, you know, I break it up by the category, like char character and stakes and plot. And one by one, I'm going to go through and dig really deep on those. Oh, so, um, great. Not just the editing. In fact, not at all the editing of it, but really a lot about how to, um, develop all of these things and also, edit. Oh, but I'm anyway, just a deeper about dive. that. But thank you. But that's sort of, my brain has been swirling around on that so much that I don't know how I could possibly try to write fiction at the same time. So I don't, I couldn't yeah. do that. I do my mornings for whatever writing I'm yeah. working on, whether that's fiction or nonfiction. And then my afternoons are actual editing. Oh, okay. And what are you editing at the moment? Are you editing your own work? Or are you still editing other people? Yeah, I still edit other people. I God, work with major publishers right. and I also work directly with authors. Oh I actually God, really love do doing it. Do it all. Uh, I like dividing my day like that, don't you? Like people <laughs> always say, oh, I want to do morning my and job. And yeah, people say, I want to write all day. And I think, oh, oh hell I could no. never do that. I could never. Two no, to three I'm hours is yes. normally my max. Yeah, exactly. And then sponge <laughs> wrung out and I have to go to another area of my brain. And I really do love editing. And it also continuing to do it is what helps me write about it, you know, because yeah. I'm seeing this stuff day after day after day and I'm getting really hands-on with it. So it makes it much more immediate when I'm writing about it. And it's, it's constantly firing up ideas about, you know, topics I can dig, uh, dig deeper into. Are you still learning at this point about? Oh yeah, editing aren't we vision? all? I mean, I would assume so. I know that I've got a lot to learn, but I look at you and I think, oh no, 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 she knows it all already. <laughs> oh, you're so nice. No, don't we all think we're imposters, or is that just me? No, I um actually, this is one of the things I love about this is um, creative arts in general. I don't think you're ever finished learning it. It's always. Yeah. There's always something new. And isn't that so exciting? I literally lie in bed and I think right now I'm reading Madeline Langle's um, journals, the circle is oh. quiet. And, and she's just, she's just musing. She's just rambling on the page. And I'm thinking, I, I can't remember how old she was when those, when she wrote those, but I'm like, I'll, I'll still be thinking and learning at that point, hopefully. Yeah. And I just find that really, really exciting for well, all of us. If you love it, it's stimulating. Yeah. It drives my husband crazy because I cannot watch anything. Oh. And I mean- commercials. I mean, anything <laughs> without analyzing the story of it. But to me, it's the funnest puzzle I could possibly think of to try to solve. And so I love seeing how things are put together and deconstructing. And honestly, one of the courses that I teach is how to train your editor brain that talks about how to watch analytically like that, mm. how to read analytically, because it's one of the, you talked earlier about getting objective about your own writing. One of the reasons I think authors have trouble with that is because we What's the first thing you do when you finish your draft? You go back to the beginning and you start revising. You've skipped editing. 
And editing is where you yes. do what I do, you know, when I'm working on an author's manuscript, which yes. is take the whole thing in, get, yeah, you're doing the, like the 30,000 foot view, yes. get that high level picture and get an idea of what you have and what the story might need to be as strong as it could be. Before you do that, you're kind of just spinning your wheels. That's the missing step that people don't understand. And that's what you teach. And that's what I teach is that step in between to figure out what what you wanted it to be. It's not what you wanted it to be. What do you want it to be? And how are you going to change this draft into yeah. closer to what you want it to be? Um, yeah, you, you got you to gotta see it before. You got to know what you have before you can do that. Would you mind telling us about that, the three rounds that you do? Yeah. Um, and this isn't always how I do it, but it's how publishers generally like to work and a lot of authors do. And I love it because I always think of it as kind of circling the drain. Um, <laughs> the first one is that big high level pass where we kind of work on the big structural stuff, the what I call the holy trinity character stakes and plot, make sure all the key elements are really strong and in place. And is there any like story, foundational story level stuff that could be strengthened or developed or deepened or clarified. Um, and then on the next pass, we kind of circle in a little bit closer and we start doing fine tuning. I, I focus a lot on what I call like micro edit elements, kind of like um, uh, strong point of view, building up suspense, the momentum, tension in the story. Um, the pace of the, of the individual scenes, we might work on some of the voice in that. And then by the third pass, we're really doing sort of the fine tuning, the line editing and polishing, which I always call that the sexy part. Cause that I think is what a lot of authors think of as revision. That's what they want to go to right after yeah, they finish it's their sexy. draft. Yeah. Oh, and it's so fun. I was going to say the one exception to my two to three hour rule, I can work two to three hours on my work, except if I'm in the sexy part, I can literally <laughs> and have literally done this for 12 hours a day, especially when I'm on a deadline and it's yeah. got to get done, but it's just so fun. And oh, it's just, it's like decorating uh, a house. Yes. You can do that all day long, but building <laughs> that sucker is a pain. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I but really you wanna... have to do that part before. I mean, like I always say, you don't hang the curtains before you got the drywall up. So you have to do the, the bigger stuff first, and then you earn the sexy part. Yeah, you earn the sexy part. I <laughs> love that. And of course, I want to say that you could hang the curtains before you do the drywall and it's just not going to work out. Yeah, it's going to leave a, a lot of weird. people unhappy and <laughs> probably cold. Yeah. Yes. Um, I would really love to get to the question that I sent you on. Can you share a craft tip with us? Oh my God. I mean, you're yes, already giving us much like time 18. do you have? <laughs> um, okay. I will share. I talked about the Holy Trinity a second yes, ago. So yes, I will I'd share love sort of what I think are my three foundational craft tips, Please. which for character, it's readers don't care what's happening until we care who it's happening to. Oh, I love that. So I'm a character editor. And to me, character is the basis of all story. Yeah. Um, and I think it's what readers hook into. I think it's, you know, we don't, we don't remember, think of the, all the most popular stories, the most enduring stories. We think of the person, we think yeah. of Sherlock Holmes, we think of Iron Man, we think, you know, it's the people That's a great that we point. hook into story on. So uh, make your, you've got to make your reader invest in that character and want to go on the journey with them, which is, which leads me to the stakes one, which is that readers don't care what is at stake for the character unless the character cares profoundly about that. So make sure that the stakes really matter to them and they're meaningful, like they have consequences and they're urgent. Like if it's something that could happen at any time, it's not that high stakes and readers mm -hmm. don't hook in that much because there's really nothing on the line. And then for plot, I always say action is not plot and plot is not story. Meaning action is just stuff happening and you kind of get a story that's a little bit episodic, a lot of exciting things, but we and don't then, know and then, where and it's then. going. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Plot is that where we kind of see the character progressing, you know, the plot is the device by which the character is chasing after her goals. Mm -hmm. And then what makes it story is that the character is changed as a direct result of chasing after her goals. I would like to point out that if anybody wants to stop this, stop listening to it right now, back up about, I'm going to say a minute and a half. That is a masterclass on what stories should be. And I'm talking about novels and memoir, because I believe memoirs are structured the same way um, in, in many, in most cases. And narrative nonfiction. And, and narrative nonfiction. Yeah. And you just laid it out bare bones. This is <laughs> why 
you're doing what you're doing and this is why it matters. And that's what story is. Um, so that might be the best craft tip I've ever heard given on this show. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I, I, I don't know if anybody else does this when they're listening to podcasts, but I really do stop things and then, or I make a note of the count, the, the minute count. And then when I get home from my walk, I start taking notes for what I just heard. So. <laughs> I did that with your Lisa Scottolini interview. <laughs> Did you so hear us write my fan letter? Did you actually, did you hear us say love you at the end? No. She's, at the very end, she goes, love you as she's hanging up. And I said, you too. <laughs> that was no, the first time awesome. we'd ever met. Oh my God. She's amazing. Um, as amazing as you. Yeah. yeah. So do you, so oh, thank do you. you, my friend. Okay. So what thing in your life affects your writing in a surprising way? Alcohol. <laughs> Tell me more because I have had um, the same probably Do you? bigger ish. Well, okay, actually, so I'm, I, I'm sober because I, it affected my writing so much. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, even as an actor, if I had even a sip of wine, I, it, there's, it cuts off some connection for me between my creativity and the execution <sighs> of it. And so I, I always joke, I'm never going to be Hemingway. You know, like I have there's no danger for me of becoming that cliche drunken author because it's done. The second I have a glass of wine or a sip of wine, it's over. How about the next funny? day? Um, I don't usually drink enough for that to be a problem. So, but back <laughs> in the day, maybe, yeah. I yeah, was actually can very, write with a hangover. I was very great. Oh, I could, I could for years really? and years and years because I had to, because I was drinking too much. And then, um, and I, but the one thing I'm very, very grateful to myself for is that I never wanted to be Hemingway. So never once <laughs> in my long illustrious drinking career, did I ever write while I was drinking. I never really? tried. I just thought it sounded so like, I thought it sounded like so much fun that I knew that I might, I, I mean, this was before I was really a problem drinker. And I thought this, this is what's going to tip you over. Cause it's going to be amazing. And I, so I never Ew, did. So I never had to smart. learn to write sober. Cause I'd already always written sober. Thank God. So, I'm afraid yeah. I would just create like a word salad. I'm sure I would. I'm sure I would. And I'm sure it would look brilliant on that day. <laughs> and that's, and that's dangerous too. You wake up in the morning. You're like, well, I don't know. That this means was that so good gotten, last night. It might've gotten me sober quicker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what is the best book that you've read recently? And why did you love it? I've been on a nonfiction tear lately. Oh, please tell. I go in, I go in phases. I do too. Um, so right now I'm reading Barack Obama's A Promised Land, which is oh. so good. But the oh. best thing I've read lately that honestly has had a, an enormous impact on me I bet you've heard this from other people on the show. Uh, Cal Newport's deep work. Oh my God, that changed my life. Oh my God, it has just I teach altered it. the way I work. Yeah, it's brilliant. I, I actually so when I I assigned it when I was teaching the memoir class at Stanford. That was one of the. It was not a memoir, but they had to read it. It's so That's simple. Brilliant. So tell us what what are the biggest takeaways that you're using from the book? Um, I didn't realize how much my focus was split until I started paying attention to it as a result of that book. And I realized I was bopping over to check email maybe every five or 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'd check my phone. Uh, my phone Even though you're an expert, you're an expert yeah. in doing this and doing this work and your attention was still split. And I was starting to feel a little bit scattered and I was, I didn't have the concentration that I'd always had. And I thought, well, I'm getting older, <laughs> but I'm not that old. So, um, I, boy, this book was just like a, an explosion in my brain. I, st I put pretty much every one of these things into practice. I even did the thing, not for a month, but he suggests quitting social media for a month without announcing it and just see if anyone misses you basically <laughs> and see if, and see if it affects your work. Now, this is harder for writers, I think, because so much of it is marketing, yeah. but it is amazing how much of your energy is sucked into that. And if you force me to choose the thing that matters the most to me. It's my deep work of editing and writing about it yeah. and, and my fiction. Yep. And that's what, I mean, not to sound grandiose, but you know, we're all put on here yeah. with a, a calling. Hopefully, that's your purpose. We're lucky. That's my purpose. Yeah. And, and do I want to dilute that purpose with something as ephemeral as email or social media? That's really not that important. So I, uh, the other thing I took away from not that book, but one by Celeste Headley called we need to talk, which is also brilliant. Uh, University of Texas did a study where even having a phone in the room, if it's turned off, I saw that study. Oh my God. It affects your mental acuity. So not only did I silence all the notifications on my phone, but I leave it in the other room. Most of the day has changed my life. 
it's who needs to jump when the phone rings and then you get to do the you know none of us want to write shallow stories we want to write meaningful deep stories and how how can you do that if you don't let yourself get in the place where you're able to do that kind of deep work you are re-inspiring me all over again. I've been um, doing the Pomodoro sessions because, mm -hmm. because I've just been so, you know, scattered with the move and different places all the time living until we get lucky. Yeah. Living in paradise. Yeah. It's so it's so rough. Um, there, and then I real I realized something really deep recently, which is the reason I'd never liked Pomodoros is that I had run them in 25 minute sessions and then five minutes to check email, check Twitter, whatever I was doing it wrong for myself. And I think I got this from um, Becca Syme is those were open loop tasks I was doing in the five minute break what does because that mean? I, it'll never stop. It's an open loop. Your email will always keep coming. Your, your oh. social, your Twitter will always, there's always something else to scroll. Um, and she, I don't think she was actually talking about Pomodoros, but I use it for Pomodoros that in that five minute break, I do a closed loop, which means I get to go up and move, uh, get another cup of tea, go to the bathroom brush my hair, do something that has an end, mm. a physical end that has nothing, that's not taking my brain away from the work. So even though I am taking that little break during the deep work, my head stays in that deep part of my writing as I'm folding the laundry or doing whatever it mm -hmm. is that I'm doing. So that's been, yeah, really I like that. Great. I think you have to find the way that works for you. He talks about yeah. different lengths. Uh, I call them focus blocks. <laughs> yes. And I think you have to find the length of focus block that works for you. And I, and I think it can change over time. Mine has always been 45, 15, like for okay. 10 years, it was 45 minutes on 15 off was my deep work. And right now it's just got to be the 25 because that's all my brain can do, but I'm still getting two to three hours of work done a day. I was going to say, you can do using a those. lot in a 25 minute chunk. That's yeah. the other thing. This has made me insanely productive. Yeah. Not just like and yeah. I'm doing better work, I think, and more focused work, but I'm doing more work in less time. And that's one of the things he argues in the book, yeah. which is, um, there's also, a, have you read Rest by Alex <gasps> Sujun Pang? No, but you know, it's sitting in my Amazon cart this second. Go click it. It's okay. As I'm important it as to me as deep work. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> I think I read a recommendation of it just recently by someone like this. And I can't think who, and I thought, Oh, I got it. Cause this is where my head's at right now. I really want to dive deep into this because this is what we love, you yeah. know, and if you're a writer or whatever it is that, that, that thing that you love that you want to do. And this is one of the things I love about your podcast is how much you are constantly encouraging writers to honor that and take themselves seriously. I love that you said that. I, it's just one of those things, again, that we have to remind ourselves every day that we get to do this, that we get to claim this mm -hmm. and we get to be serious about this thing that we love. Thank you for saying that. Tell us where we can find you. And I, this is, um, let's tell, you know what, tell us about the new book, the new novel, because it'll probably be very close to being released by the time this goes okay. out. It's called the way we weren't. It's about a woman <laughs> who great experiences. Title. I stole it <laughs> with her permission from author Camille Pagan. Oh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> she awesome. was going to use it for one of her books and decided not to. And I was like, um, Hey, if you're not using that, Excuse me. And she was really nice. And she goes, sure, it's all yours. I will always give her credit. But anyway, it's a woman who experiences a major crisis in her marriage, long-term marriage. It makes her question everything. One day she gets in her car and keeps driving and winds up at the beach, uh, passed out from dehydration. And an uh, old man who's lived there his entire life finds her outside of his house. And even though he's kind of a curmudgeon in the worst possible way, he helps her. And these two develop sort of an unlikely bond where they wind up having to face a whole bunch of things in their histories that they've been avoiding. And they, it sounds so women's fiction, doesn't it? Secrets are revealed. And they <laughs> kind of become the key to each of them being able to move forward and finally let go of things. I was just thinking like, this is my catnip. This is what I want to immediately go I love women's by. fiction. Oh, I do too. I'm all, it's, you know, character. It's the emotional oh, journey. Character. And to me, that's what story is. And it's just undiluted in women's fiction, which I love. And it's so, it's so funny. Cause right now I'm focusing on the nonfiction. So I'm not doing fiction, but in my fiction bucket rattling around in the back of my brain. And I make notes of uh, maybe once a day or once every two days about this book. It is about a woman abandoning the life she has and going to the coast, which is basically no. what I've done too, right? Like I have yeah. abandoned the life I had and ended up at the coast. But like if a women's fiction book has that at all, I'm just like, no, just take take my money. I mean, at some point we've all kind of thought about doing that, yes. right? Yes, <laughs> yes. So tell us where we can find you. 
Uh, best place for the editing stuff is foxprinteditorial.com. And I've got a ton of free resources on there for authors um, and also other resources, but I've got like a self-editing checklist. I've got a, nice. a get it edited guide for how to find and vet uh, reputable editors and what to look for and what it should look like and what it should cost. I've got online That's courses. great. I didn't know about that. I'm going to, I'm going to use that and give and send my students to that place. Oh, good. Please so, do. It's perfect. got a great big list of like specific places to look for good editors and how yep. to, there's so many people out there who are editing and, um, you know, it's a box of chocolates. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. So, so be an informed purchaser and also Fabulous. make sure you get the right editor for you. And this is hopefully will help people do that. And then I've got, um, online courses on there and my book is on there and a whole you should bunch get of the book resources. everyone listening you should get the book just go get the book <laughs> i'm serious intuitive editing just one click and then i write under the pseudonym uh, phoebe fox and so that's phoebefoxauthor.com although my books are also on my fox print website all of them are so you can see them you can see everything everywhere i i didn't used to uh i didn't used to meld the two identities phoebe was kind of a secret oh and, about and now a it's year an ago, secret. I did, yeah i decided to out her it's so much easier. I I've had a it couple is. of different identities, but now they're all, all in one. R H Heron, and it felt a little. Yeah. It felt a little artificial because I work yeah. with all these authors, and I was kind of um, concealing yeah. the fact that I I am one too. And it was for the wrong reasons. It was because, you know, as an editor, I thought, what if they read my books and they don't <laughs> like it? And that's, that just that's felt so silly, ungenuine. They would read the books and think, oh my god, I have the best editor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And this, and let's, let's, uh, not, uh, avoid the question that will come up. Are you accepting clients at this point? And if you are, how does that work? I, I mostly tend to stay close to clients just because I book out yeah. so early, but right around the beginning of every year I open up and then, you know, how you have many a mailing can... list? Uh, I have, yeah, I do. I have my newsletter subscriber thing, which okay. Everybody who's on there will be the first to be notified when I open up to queries. Great. Um, and that also, I have a weekly blog and you get that directly to your inbox, but that's probably the best way to find out when I have availability. Why am I not subscribed to that? That is, I'm going to immediately go subscribe. I don't know how I, I don't know, that. but I'm so glad you said this because one of the things I'm going to totally put you on the spot. <laughs> Good. One of the things I have on my website is a feature called how writers revise and it's everything we've been talking about. I'm trying yeah. to pull the curtain back on this part of the process that doesn't get talked about as often as it should. And I interview authors about challenges they faced in their careers and how they overcame them. And then I ask them to answer some questions about their specific editing process. And I was hoping you might come on and do that. Yes. Yes. Yay. I tried to like even get it before you stop talking. Yes. I would love <laughs> to, I would be honored. To. I would love it. And this is how friendships are built to everyone. <laughs> this is how it goes. Tiffany, thank you so much for being here. I am so glad we had like two or three different things that might've pushed our, our meeting again today. And I'm so glad that we didn't. Me I am, too. I'm so it's appreciative so of nice you. so nice to finally connect. Yeah. Thank and you. I love you too, Rachel. I love you. <laughs> I'm going to actually, this is the new litmus test. If I don't say, if we don't say, I love you at the end, then it's really not a good interview. Now every other guest <laughs> is going to be like, okay. And I love you just FYI. <laughs> <laughs> You're the best, my friend. Okay. Thank you for Take having care. me.